All right, thanks everybody. My name is Andrew Gaffney. I'm really uh, pleased to meet all of you and um, I want to introduce myself. I am uh, editor and founder of Retail Touchpoints. We are an industry publication that was launched uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, the reason or the thinking behind the, the publication when we launched it was I'd covered retail, I kind of grew up in retail, and a lot of the coverage, the sort of points of view at the time were around supply chain, a lot of things we've been talking about today, the whole work, warehouse club driving retail expansion at the time. We saw a shift when we launched Retail Touchpoints that really customer experience was going to sort of decide the day going forward. So um, we've covered a lot about mobile, we've covered a lot about different touch points, obviously given the name um, and how that's changing retail. And so some of the topics that we're, we've been discussing that I really enjoyed today, I want to uh, congratulate and uh, thank Laura and Ed for putting out a great uh, agenda today, some really great speakers, so <laughs> kudos for that. Um, we're really excited, we're partnering with, with Laura and Ed, so we're excited to get involved with today's agenda. Our goal in, in working with, with Laura and Ed is to continue this. So we're going to plan to do uh, coverage and thought leadership. We're going to do an ebook, uh, working with their team going forward to uh, expand on some of the coverage today and share it with a wider audience, and then continue this, these conversations and the themes that we're, we're touching on today with blogs, podcasts, a number of different media uh, types throughout the year. So again, kudos this is a really great uh, launch point for us, and we're excited to, to go forward. So um, the next session that I'm excited to, to lead in this panel, uh, Laura and Ed and I were talking about the, this goal of, of attribution and measurement. So one of the big hurdles for uh, innovation and particularly around digital for a lot of stores traditionally was the quick question when you bring anything new to uh, a retail board or, or leadership is okay, what's it gonna cost? How long is it gonna take to pay for itself? And as we've talked about throughout the day here, that's not always a fundamental easy uh, math problem. So I think there's been some great perspectives today, but I, we've got a panel today that's going to look a little broader than just attribution, but really a, a wider perspective on some of the trends that are going on around digital, maybe some different ways to think about ROI and measurement and, and sort of what the impact of digital can be. So I want to start by asking our, my panel to introduce themselves. Uh, Joey, let me start with you with just a little bit of background about you and the company. Sure. Hey there, uh, my name is Joey Lloyd. I'm the Vice President of Marketing and Business Development for an LED manufacturer based out of Atlanta, Georgia. We're Nano Lumens. Um, you can catch us downstairs if anybody's heading over to DSC tomorrow. Um, and I've actually known Andrew for a number of years. I actually have a background in PR and public relations and with lots of retailers. So I've known these guys for a long time. Um, if you're not catching up on retail touch points, you definitely should. Hey, hey everyone, thanks for having me today. Uh, my name is Mike Neal. Uh, I work at a company called Ad Mobilize, and we are a computer vision and AI uh, focused company building software and hardware solutions uh, for digital out of home and also retail. Awesome. So let me, let me get started. I want to continue. Last session was great. I'm, I'm sure you all enjoyed it. it. It's really great to get those great outside perspectives outside of the industry. So I wanted to ask both of you, Joe, I'll start with you. Uh, when we look at digital, and obviously digital signage is a key part of what's going to be going on over the next couple of days, where do you see innovations, whether in traditional retail or maybe in some related industries, malls, entertainment complexes, what are some of the new platforms, formats, approaches that you're seeing that you think would be of interest to the, to the audience? I think everybody over the past, you know, five plus years, we keep hearing digital innovation. I, I have a digital innovation. I'm going to spend money. I'm going to do something. And then nobody really knows what that means. And particularly in retail, I think we've seen this trial and error of bringing digital into the store really as a competition to what we see happening online. And I think most retailers have kind of come to terms. Amazon is here. They're staying. They might be kicking our butts, that kind of thing. But really figuring out about the experience and how to bring all of that together. And so for me on the manufacturing side, we're seeing a lot more that is happening in terms of experience. How do I create this experience for millennial shoppers? How do I bring those folks who it's easy enough to you know, buy or click on my phone? How do I get them back into my store? Um, and so with the, the digital there, it's, it's more than just a TV on the wall. It's really figuring out how to create that experience and understanding it. And I think the biggest growth, honestly, has been in the fact that people have stopped with is it just going to increase my sales? Ultimately, of course, that's what we all want, but when you're looking at a screen on a wall, that's, that's not your number one thing. It's really about trying to figure out 
what is my goal here? Is it about a brand? Is it about an experience? Is it actually about the fact that I want to use some kind of personalization to say, hey, it's raining outside. I probably should be promoting those umbrellas that are sitting on the wall. So we're starting to see lots of changes that way. Great. So you, you touched on Joey, but Mike, see if you could expand on it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Digital signage, your purely was you know, offer based maybe of you know, promoting specific things. How are you seeing the content served up to digital changing and that, that digital experience changing? <laughs> Yeah, so I think where I'm seeing a lot change is that I think consumers now expect some sort of engagement uh, right, right when you walk into the door, right? And I think the uh, digital signage as a medium to enhance or promote that engagement uh, is really an exciting opportunity. And I think some of the trends that are really affecting that are you know, really started 20 years ago when the internet really came to fruition. and uh, came at mass scale. And for generations like myself um, and those that will follow, we've never known anything else besides that, right? Um, so Just making us feel old. Sorry. Don't mean to make everyone feel old, but there's a there's Too late, a <laughs> no. I think I think what will help what will help that is that I think there's a huge opportunity to uh, make sure that the experience that's designed um, in these physical locations somewhat mimic what people now expect, right? Uh, and I think that will produce uh, an insane opportunity going forward. I think one of the, the subtle things that I've seen, I have a 13-year-old son, and, you know, it's hard for me to say I, I love him, you know, dearly. He constantly is running up to me with his phone and saying, check out this video. And for me, you know, that's some on the screen. I'm like, I can barely make it out. And it's some <laughs> stupid 30 second video that I'm kind of at the end. I'm like, I don't get it. But that's, that's the, where he lives. It's just, it's everything's video. Yeah. Everything's short. Everything is driven by that screen. And he's, my, my, he doesn't watch TV. So I was interested to hear, you know, the MGM conversation before of people listening to music. He never turns on the TV. It's constantly on his, his, his device. So I think that's just changing expectations and experiences for that whole new generation. Yeah, and I mean, just a personal example. If I walk into anywhere and I see a screen and nothing really happens, uh, you know, just a static flip through, the ROI of that screen immediately becomes zero for me, and I kind of just move on, right? So, and I think that. I think that's becoming more and more true as you know more screens get put into stores. Is that people expect that engagement and they want it as well? Any examples of what a good engagement, like you know, rather than that sort of flat experience, what we've yeah. seen do well? Or so I think some of the uh, like sensor technologies that are enhancing engagement um, and uh, just promoting it are things like voice, things like touch and gesture where uh, you walk into a specific environment and you understand that you can interact with this display to get what you want, which could be information, it could be locating a specific product or store, and uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, you know, manufacturers, a lot of uh, content specialists, a lot of designers actually creating those environments based on those sensor technologies so that when I do walk into a specific location, let's say I want to figure out where a specific product is, I can easily find that through some sort of interaction, um, whether it's voice or touch or something like that. Yeah, that's a good point. Joe, if we heard you know, the gaming perspective before, which is interesting, mm -hmm. if, when you're talking to retailers, if you tell them to look outside of sort of just their competitors or whoever, where do you tell them to go look for interesting applications of digital or sort of innovative things they might be able to learn from? We've seen some really interesting stuff happening in the arena side. Um, so we've had two arenas that we've worked with that have really gone digital full bore. So we're talking wayfinding signs, we're talking about large format, huge displays, and particularly um, we had the opportunity to work with Miami Heat and they had redone the American Airlines Arena. They had this like 20,000 square foot outdoor area. If anybody's from Miami, you'll know. Yep, there you go. So their arena overlooks Biscayne Bay, which is, it, we're talking every cruise ship capital, you know, it's gorgeous. They had 20,000 square feet that was a smoker's deck. It was nothing more, it was underutilized to say it nicely. And so they went through a full renovation and they brought in um, and did some LED displays and some really interesting stuff. We were only a small portion of what the larger redesign was. 
they paid for all of that leaps and bounds pretty much immediately. They were able to sell the advertising and, and you know, from the named sponsorships down to just the normal advertising running through on game day. They sold out that sponsorship before they ever launched and, and relaunched and opened the area. But in addition to that, they have real, true new revenue streams that are coming through based on the fact that People are actually now coming early to the game. They're staying late. They're actually tailgating in a way that I don't think basketball's really ever seen. They've increased their sales in food and beverage, and they've in increased their, uh, their gear sales as well. So they've seen some really interesting things. And I think one of my favorite stories, and this is something you guys actually covered, we had the opportunity to work with Madame Tussauds um, in Times Square. And so, you know, really, you know, great location. Um, tons and tons of foot traffic, but Madame Tussauds was known as this very old sort of wax. archaic <laughs> wax, exactly. And so what they were finding was that people weren't coming in because they thought, well, I don't really want to go walk through a museum. I don't care about that, right? And then all of a sudden they sort of realized, well, everybody's got their phone in their hand and what are we doing with our phones? We're taking selfies. And so they used a large format display in the window to start driving traffic in. And instead of keeping a wax figure, you know, taped out, you know, behind the red, you know, lines, and people thought, well, I don't, I don't really care about that. They actually showed the selfies and, you know, hey, here I am with Taylor Swift, here I am with Prince Harry. They increased their traffic by like hundreds of thousands just from having a digital display that helped to tell this story of, hey, we are actually super cool, come in and check us out. So there's some interesting stuff happening out there. Yeah. So Mike, Joey touched on um, the Miami Heat. We're able to you know, pay for the expense of it and maybe mm -hmm. generate a revenue source. Mm -hmm. What are you seeing from the, the ad side? I mean, what are some of the innovations you're seeing? What are, how is that driving attribution discussion? Yeah, so I think on the, the ad side, and I think in terms of uh, retail, entertainment, um, you know, uh, all these different types of locations, uh, building an ad network uh, has traditionally been kind of tough, and a lot of them haven't necessarily succeeded perhaps as well as people thought they would, right? Um, so I, I think where we're seeing a lot of interesting things happen is around the concept of measurement using different sensor technologies. Uh, what we do and what I have very first-hand experience with is using cameras to do audience measurement uh, anonymously to detect simple things like how many people saw this display and at which time and what did they see, for instance, and then adding more uh, in-depth uh, metrics such as demographics and emotion and all sorts of other interesting um, attributes. But from what we see uh, from the actual marketing teams that are helping to develop these advertising networks, selling it to brands, is that just the sheer fact that we can tell someone how many people saw the screen is leaps and bounds ahead of perhaps what they had seen before. Um, so that's producing an interesting uh, advantage for retail-based ad networks uh, that maybe hadn't been seen maybe 10, 15 years ago. Um, and is, is sort of building an interesting story, not only for, uh, I think, just third-party advertising, but actually advertising brands that are in that store itself. Great. Um, there was some interesting conversation this morning around CMOs and sort of where CMOs sit in this innovation technology discussion. When, you know, specific to digital signage, digital innovation, where, where are you seeing the CMO conversation? Are you seeing some CMOs that are we're taking the lead in this and what are some of the things that, that can help sort of change or advance that discussion? This is one of my least favorite topics of conversation <laughs> as a marketer. So. When I go through and I look at my sales cycle, I've got literally like 150 titles that we sell to at any given moment of, well, this one bought that, and this one did this, and this one was an influencer, so I hate personas, mm -hmm. and I refuse to do it. Um, that said, usually for me at least, the CMO is included in the conversation. They're usually not the purchaser of digital signage. We're sort of looking to see where is the rollout happening in retail. Um, so we at NanoLumens have done really well in flagship, so you'll find us in some really great locations of your top tier stores that are you know, out there doing amazing things. Um, T-Mobile is one that I can talk about. We've done like five of their flagship locations. We have some others that I can't, unfortunately. 
Um, and so we do really well there, and the CMO is involved in the conversation. But oftentimes, we're working with the technology folks, and it's really great when you get the CMO and the CTO and the CIO all there kind of talking at the same time and really understanding this isn't just a TV that you're throwing on the wall. It's understanding, you know, how is this going to influence the experience in your stores, and then how are you going to use, like, technologies like Mike has to really personalize that experience and understand that you might have thought that your demographic was 70% men and only 30% female, and then all of a sudden you find out, you know, through analytics that it's completely swapped or the age differences are there. And being able to then, through the CMO and, and their network and, and their employees, be able to personalize that content. That's where this becomes amazing. Mike, are you seeing that the, the push towards segmentation, personalization, a lot of these buzzwords, the things that we're writing about and talking about a lot, is, is that taking, taking shape or CMO is more interested from that? Sorry. Yeah, and it's, it's really interesting what's been happening just in the last year, I would say, where uh, traditionally also we would speak to like the operations, the technologists, the, innovate, the VP of innovation, right, um, about what we're doing, how we're, you know, the, the whole bit. But increasingly what we're seeing is that we're actually engaging with the marketing teams and in some cases the CMOs at these various locations and various projects, right, with these brands. And uh, it's, it's been really interesting to see the evolution of that because I think what it's telling us is that uh, marketers really need and, and love data, right? And they get this data uh, through their online e-commerce businesses, right? And, you know, it's sort of like a daily activity. I think what is being provided by uh, all sorts of sensor technologies and certainly ours is the ability to get um, you know a, a dashboard daily and see what all these different metrics uh, associated with digital media inside a store, stadium, et cetera, how that's affecting uh, business, right? And we just launched sort of a, a tagline, which is like marketers love measurement, right? And I think if you ask any marketer if they could answer simple questions like, is anyone looking at this display? Uh, what are they looking at? Uh, where are these displays um, and, and which displays are getting more views than not? Uh, you really start to engage those teams and perhaps those budgets as well. Joey, you touched on uh, T-Mobile. Um, you know, one of the things that leading into the, this conversation in the panel, again, traditional really hardcore metrics were, okay, if I put the sign up, did mm -hmm. more people buy whatever I was, you know, advertising or displaying. Beyond that sort of old, old school thinking, what are uh, companies like T-Mobile, how are they looking at benefit, payout, uh, payoffs, what, what are some of the, the impact they're seeing? They're looking at it as an experience. This is, this is not at the end, it, it, it's not about I, I, I sold another phone or you know, we sold a service. This is about creating this amazing experience. There's a T-Mobile right on the, on the strip. I haven't had a chance to see it, I've only seen pictures. Um, if you have a chance to get there, I'm gonna get there this week. It's described as a nightclub. Like they've just created mm -hmm. this whole experience that you walk in and the music's going and the magenta pink, they, it's T-Mobile magenta by the way, just in case you, you needed to know that. Um, it's, it's all there and it's about creating this experience that people are, are flocking to because they wanna be a part of that brand. They, they feel like they have some kind of, of relationship there and that, that's what we're seeing a lot of. Okay, and Mike, does that change in the conversation you guys have? I mean, you talked about sort of the intelligence and data they can gather. Is it changing the dynamic of they're not just looking pure sort of ROI from conversion standpoint? What are the other sort of metrics you're hearing interest in? Or yeah, I think traditionally, you know, as Joey touched on, you would see, you know, uh, I put this screen here, I play this content here, and I should get maybe a, an increase in sales over X period of time, um, and that was sort of a very linear process, right? Um, but I think what data is providing is a, uh, you know, helping certainly with, with that linear process, um, but also uh, allowing marketers um, to look at it at different angles, right? Um, and seeing not only short-term gains, but also being able to measure more long-term um, uh, effectiveness and potential gains as well. Uh, a lot of this we're seeing is actually being done via like uh, social media and being able to track how users at like some of these flagship stores are engaged, mm -hmm. you know, taking selfies, like I think you said earlier, mm -hmm. um, and how that actually translates over time into more brand awareness, more brand loyalty, and eventually sales. Um, and it's all 
being made possible through these uh, interactive, you know, amazing experiences that I think uh, people now expect and look forward to, whether it's at, you know, the biggest flagship store like in Vegas, and they also have one in South Beach, T-Mobile specifically, or, you know, your, your local store as well. I think uh, there's varying degrees of experiences and, you know, wow factors. Um, but I think we'll start to see more retailers not only doing the big flagship, you know, experiences, but also bringing it down to the local level and saying, how can we use digital media and also data to create a similar wow effect? Do you see it, Mike, getting to a point kind of like, you know, the, the brick and mortar is trying to keep up with the digital experience or online experience? Do you see them looking more at like dwell time or um, you know, be able to look at segment what, what customers did what? Is that one of the goals or interests for, for retailers? Yeah, we, I mean, dwell time is always an important <laughs> metric. I think um, even just going back to you know, the very simple thing, which is a uh, number of viewers uh, at certain retailers that have brick and mortar and also big box stores, you know, we get uh, calls and emails all the time about uh, the trends they see in, in viewership, right? Uh, when they go up, when they go down, and uh, you know, even something simple as like uh, the number of viewers on this certain day is lower than uh, another day or a week or something. And uh, they always ask us why that is, or you know, we have a long conversation about it usually, and that's telling me that a lot of these marketers at these, you know, whether it's brick and mortar or big box are actually paying a lot of attention to uh, these different metrics that are coming out of these sensor technologies as it relates to digital media. And uh, I'm not sure if I, you know, I've been working on this for about four or five years and I hadn't seen that type of engagement quite yet um, in terms of, you know, how people are using digital media. But I think it's because they're trying to take it from, I think Randy said it best, a broadcast device, right, that's just kind of there to act, an actual engagement device that produces an action, whether it's a search, uh, whether it's uh, you know saving information, learning something new, you know whatever it might be, and I think that eventually turns into some measurable ROI, which could be in T-Mobile's case a new phone or something like that. Um, but I think if you have all these different touch points that you can measure and then also create actions for the consumer to take, then you have something really interesting. I think there's so many options. You know, I think that the Ultas and the Sephoras of the world have done a really good job with this, sort of the, the last second, what are you doing while you're waiting in line? Mm -hmm. And that's my favorite place in the store, actually, is when I'm waiting in line and I get to look at all the little things that are like only like 10 and $15, and I'm like, oh, well, I've already bought all the big stuff I need. Ooh, I want to try that. They've done a really great job of that where I think sort of the targets and the, the big box probably haven't done as good of a job. Like, there's only so much gum I need in my life. So I don't really look at that anymore. But one of the stats that I pulled as I was preparing was that there's a 30% perception drop uh, or raise in perception that um, your, your perceived wait time is less if you're actually engaged. And if you think about what are you doing while you're waiting in line to pay, you're probably on your phone. You're not engaged in what's going on at the store. And I haven't personally seen a retailer that's done this. We, you know, we kind of went online and cold and looked around. I'd love to see something like that and to see how that works. Yeah, even the queue line in Whole Foods where you're like, I gotta pay attention to what my number is, at least mm -hmm. there's something going on. So yeah. it feels like there's movement. Um, Mike, when you, you talk about them asking questions like, wait a minute, why did my mother viewership dip these? Were there any aha moments of like, when you look at that for them, you say, well, it's because this happened or you showed this or? Yeah, typically we see, um, that viewership drops when content isn't refreshed regularly. And for different locations, regular can mean a different time span. But I think it goes back to that consumers expect a certain engagement or a certain something in front of them that interests them. And if you show someone the same thing over and over again, uh, typically they will stop engaging with that item, right? Even if they were interested the first time, uh, if they keep saying the same, seeing the same message over and over, the same product or whatever it might be, um, then I think you, you know, there's a, kind of a law of diminishing return, right? And I think that's sort of an obvious fact, but what we've been able to show is through data uh, that that is actually a fact uh, in terms of content and on a digital display, is that if you keep showing the same static image, you're gonna keep getting the same static result. 
So we've been trying to help companies understand not only just viewership, but you know, as, a, as it relates to a general audience, but also viewership as it relates to like certain demographics, certain uh, demographics at certain stores, certain markets, et cetera, um, so that they can actually update content and produce the, the action that they want instead of the action that they don't want, which is no action. Um, Joey, one of the, the struggles for brick and mortar retail is, is obviously as more people shop online that there may be less, less need to, to go to physical stores. So traffic, you know, getting people to stores. Um, you do work with, with some malls. What, what are you seeing you know, malls and shopping centers doing? How are they using digital to, to either you know, get people engaged or, yeah. or create a different experience? I think stateside we've seen a lot going on with Simon Malls. Um, and they're putting up kiosks and sort of these digital interactive um, areas for people to come and, and find what they're looking for, you know, kind of check out the map, those types of things. And, and those seem super cool. Um, in Australia, we do actually do a lot of work, and what we've been able to do there is um, sort of bring together, we call it digital wallpaper. Um, so our, our displays are, are flexible. They're, they actually curve and, and do interesting things. So we've been able to sort of create these experiences with things that are hanging from glass ceilings and interacting with the chandeliers and, and things like that. And I, I think outside, just heard recently, um, I was in Amsterdam for a major AV show, and they were, there were a couple of malls um, in the Middle East that are using tons of analytics to really personalize their content. And they've got the metrics that show, you know, people are stopping, they're buying more from the brands that are advertising more, and they're really starting to see that at the mall level versus the store level. You know, we talked a little bit about sports and selling the advertising, and I don't see retailers necessarily doing that. Um, but the mall certainly can. Yep. Anything you'd add to that, Mark? Yeah, I mean, I'll just add one one use case that I can't name the brand, but it's interesting because it's a big box store that traditionally would not invest in signage. And we started this project maybe about nine months ago now. Um, but what what's interesting is that with the what they're doing with the data is um, actually selling that space and you know where the screen is and the space on the screen to the brands within that store in their specific sections right mm -hmm. um, and they're selling it based on the audience measurement data not only from us but a couple other different sources uh, and traditionally they would not have been able to do that they would actually give that space away for free um, so they're actually using the money from that you know in-store advertising to actually fuel the growth of signage in their, uh, you know, their, their very large big box stores, you know, across the U.S. So, um, advertising-wise, that's one example that has been really interesting to us. You, you touched on it earlier, Mike, but uh, content has been one of the other uh, hurdles or objections over the years. If I, if I do digital signage, where am I going to have to pay to create content? Is it still uh, still an objection? How certain creative ways or trends you're seeing around the content aspect of either getting it created or how, how do you? Mm -hmm could drive innovation around it. Yeah, so con content's interesting um, in that I think before, even a year ago, a lot of marketing teams would see updating and creating content regularly for signage as almost like a nuisance, right? Um, or something that was added to their workload. Um, and I'm not sure the exact reasons for that are, um, besides maybe some of the obvious ones, but. What we've seen in working with marketing teams now that they are using some of our data to measure this and other data sources to measure uh, and understand interaction with different audiences uh, is that they've been more engaged in creating content, uh, not only just on their own manually, but also uh, using systems to automate the delivery of that content based on a certain demographic, let's say. Uh, and that's been a big shift um, recently. And then also, you know, there's a lot of solutions providers, system integrators that are uh, creating whole business units that specialize in creating content or helping to create content uh, for the retailers to drive certain actions, right? Uh, which has been also really interesting. One of the things that was interesting about Madame Tussauds is essentially it's user-generated content. So is that one mm -hmm. of the things that you're saying that could just be a simple it use can, case or? Yeah, it, it can go from really simple to extremely complex, to be perfectly honest. And, you know, social media is kind of fun. And I think that 
my children's generation, I have a 13-year-old and a 16-year-old, so I'm right there with you about, he's constantly showing me videos. Um, but they, they want to sort of be famous, like that's sort of this idea of these YouTube stars. Like, so yeah. being a part of that and seeing that social media and that user-generated content, as long as you don't have you know, a lot of negative issues, is, is really great. Um, you know, we, we don't actually create content at NanoLumen, so we get that question a lot about how to do it. But I think what's starting to be understood is that the creation of static signage and having to ship that out on a very regular basis um, is actually more expensive. So when you look at the ROI of do I have to buy the digital sign and then create the content for it, you're actually getting a much better ROI than having to ship out that color story or that seasonal change you know, every so often and, and to all of those stores. So I think we're seeing a major shift there. Mike, I just wanted to kind of wrap up on the intelligence and sort of data-driven factor. Any, any use case you could share, even if it's unnamed, about sort of how a, re a retailer or a brand has been able to use that intelligence to either change messaging or mm -hmm. you know, drive better engagement? Yeah, so I think there's, there's two examples, and one starts sort of uh, even uh, before or during you know, the implementation of a small pilot in terms of digital media. And then the other pertains to when you already have digital media and how data can help kind of tell a better story. So what we've seen recently as well is that actually having data from the start of a project uh, is actually increasing the investment or the life of that project um, as it goes forward. Um, so some examples are uh, we did a small project with Express uh, in, in Ohio. And Express, I don't think, has any digital signage, maybe besides some flagship stores. Um, and what we were able to show them in terms of data and audience measurement um, really wowed them and is actually progressing us uh, and our partner to uh, a next stage past just a, a demo or a, a small couple store pilot, right? Uh, which has been really interesting. And we see a lot more of those stories and those projects coming about as well. Um, but I think in terms of uh, when we are working with an established network, we see a lot of advertising um, in terms of product placement or promotion, uh, sort of like in the previous example, uh, has helped drive the adoption of signage where perhaps previously uh, actually starting an ad network, so to say, didn't really turn out so well or normally doesn't turn out super well. Um, at these locations, but through the advent and the adoption of all these different sensor and data technologies, brands from the actual product people are valuing the, the real estate, so to say, a bit more than maybe they were before, and actually investing in that more, which for some of our newer clients who maybe did not invest in digital media or signage in any other spaces before, uh, is allowing them to spend more money on it now uh, because of that adoption. Okay. All right. We've about run through our 30 minutes. So Ed has a mic. I think we're going to take some uh, questions from the audience. Anybody have questions for, for Joey or Mike? Back here. This is for Joey. Your, your project that you mentioned with uh, Miami Heat mm -hmm. and kind of retooling that portion of the arena, did that also include a customer experience uh, component other than just remapping that area, but also added an option for fans to opt in on an application? Not that I know of, and we weren't involved in that. They're, they're continuing to innovate and do some interesting things. For them, it was really about um, how to get people back into the arena. I think that's been a, a major struggle in sports is, you know, our TVs are great at home, right? You got your couch, you got your food, it doesn't cost you a ton of money, like you're there and ready to go. And for the Heat, it was about trying to create this experience to bring people in. And I've been to a couple of games. Um, what's amazing is even on games where, where they lose, the amount of people that stay put and stay involved and, and utilize that space. And not only did they create um, you know, game day stuff, but they actually created off game day events. You know, they're now able to sell that space for, for other things. And so it's really, it's, it's just amazing to watch how that's grown. But n I, we know of other teams that are doing, you know, the real experience there and, and are starting to say, hey, you're a season ticket holder. We want to identify you on your walk-in. We're going to use a yep. beacon. We're going to do that. We're starting to see that happen and being talked about. Um, but the Miami Heat, no. With that concept and certainly technical capabilities, do you mm -hmm. see that 
opportunity transitioning into retail, the retail space? I do. I mean, if I, we're all consumers. I'm a shopper. I like clothes, I like shoes, and I like makeup. Um, you know, I think it's about the personalization. I think one of my favorite things, I was just telling this story um, last night. Um, I'm down in Atlanta, and we have Kroger, and I don't know if anybody is familiar with Kroger and dealt with their click list, their, their loyalty program. But in my opinion, Kroger did an amazing job. They took this loyalty program that they had that was really nothing more than, oh, you're going to discount my food and you're going to give me some gas points that I don't really care about at any point in time. And all of a sudden, they launched this thing called ClickList, which is their e-commerce. Order your food. You can either uh, go pick it up an hour later or you can have it delivered. But what was amazing is the second I logged in and created my account with my loyalty card that I never thought twice about, all of a sudden, my food was there. My food, what I buy on a weekly basis, down to the K cup that I buy every single week. And it's about that personalization. You know, that's the great thing about shopping is when you have that person that you shop from who knows you, knows you know what's going on with your family, knows the things that you're doing in life, that real personalization. And we kind of lost that online. We got the ease, but we lost the personal touch. So I, I think that's all going to come together. Any other questions? Here. Here. A question for you, Mike. Um, I, I think what, what's kind of coming across as I'm listening, and it was great. I, I really, really got a lot out of y'all's y'all's conversation. But it seems like I think in our brain, this seems like it should be strategic. But so many people are. It seems like that they're. It's tactical to them. Um, can you? Uh, I mean, a is that is that on target? And and then who is who is using this kind of? Uh, of a thought process to be strategic. Because I think Joey's kind of, Joey and I had this conversation last night, and I think Kroger is just so far ahead of almost everybody else in using the data that they get from their loyalty cards to actually craft the offer that keeps that virtuous cycle going. But in your world, do you see anybody that's really doing this stuff strategically to, you know, to create a competitive advantage? Yeah, I mean, one, which is right now small in the brick and mortar space, but um, obviously has a huge impact is Amazon, right? Amazon is using all sorts of these different technologies in their Go concept, but as you might guess, was going to transition that into Whole Foods at some point in the future, I would assume, um, to create a, a massive advantage, right? And it, it kind of goes back to what Joey was saying about personalization. Essentially, that's what they're going to build into, uh, you know, what they're doing not only with the Go concept, but Whole Foods and I'm sure other stores as well, where uh, it, it becomes expected that this is going to be your experience, and it's actually seen as a huge advantage um, from a corporate level and from a consumer level uh, to have this sort of technology, uh, you know, uh, being used on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Um, so I think Amazon's probably the best example, uh, even though their footprint's somewhat small today. I think that will change as we go along, and I think you'll see many, many other retailers doing similar uh, concepts as we go forward as well. I think the departments have to unsilo. Has anybody been in a store and then you get an email a day or two later that says, "Hey, we miss you"? Yeah. I'm an Ann Taylor shopper. I, lo I loft all the time usually in store, very little online. Notoriously, I will be in the store and a day later, I get a phone call, I get an email from them. Hey, we miss you, here's 10% off. And I'm like, dear God, you don't know me. You <laughs> should know me, I'm your best customer. I am a 40 year old woman, mother of two. I am your ideal customer. Why don't you know me? So these things all have to unsilo and come together. Oh, it was huge. Imagine if you could take, you know, Mike's dwell time and put that together with, you know, all of your marketing that you're doing outbound and, and have all of that come together. It would be amazing. So I have one last question. Um, one of the themes we've seen is, you know, screens are two-way now. It's two-way conversation. Mm -hmm. So talk about voice. What is there, uh, what's happening with voice right now and, and how does, uh, how is that going to impact retail with wayfinding and sales and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, so I guess I can take a crack at it. So I think voice is, uh, I mean, super interesting. I mean, if you've been to any technology show, 
CES, whatever it may be, voice has dominated uh, everything in, in the past year, I would say, and will continue this year, I believe, as well. Um, so I think it comes down to really uh, just two things, interaction and eventually personalization. Um, and it's all about finding information quickly and seamlessly. And I think voice presents that opportunity. And when actually connected to like a, some sort of digital media or display, can be really dynamic in how it's delivered. Um, and actually, uh, you know, going back to the, one of the first points, engage the consumer in a way that draws them in and keeps them searching and exploring until they take an action, right? And I think voice really presents that amazing opportunity as, uh, as that scales out. I don't know. I don't use voice. I'm like, I have an Alexa at home. I've got, you probably see me poking at my smartwatch because it keeps going off. I don't know. I don't use voice. So I'm kind of interested to see how other people do it. I, show of hands. Any, how many of you actually talk to your devices? Got, what, maybe 25, 30% yeah. of the room? So it'll be really interesting. Yeah, I think it's still a little clunky, but the, the, some of the interesting thing was the amount of units that have been sold this year. So you don't really know yeah. if you're using it, but to, to have it in your house now yeah. and they, and then just the investments of the big four that are making, I mean, they clearly see that that's where oh, yeah. the next frontier is. So, All right, I think we're wrapping up. Thank you guys both. Uh, Thank you. Thanks again.